I'm excited this morning for a couple reasons. One, I have been talking about for a long time uh, about starting a series or going into the book of Revelation. How many of you know that's that scary book yeah. that uh, you read it and you're like, what is happening here? And so what happens oftentimes in that book as two things happen, uh, go to extremes, and we've all seen the guys on, on television to say, hey, send me all your money and I'll tell you when Jesus is coming back. And maybe a little bit of an exaggeration, and they, they use all these scary prophecies and they'll pull out uh, local news articles and say, see, it's happening. Don't worry, we're not doing that this morning. Some of you are like, man, I was hoping for that. Um, so sorry to disappoint. But we are going to be uh, jumping in. I was really feeling strongly uh, just in this season, the especially the beginning of the book of Revelation, uh, there's seven letters that go get sent out to the seven churches of, of Asia Minor. It's in modern-day Turkey, and, and I'll get into explaining more of that here. I tend to get excited and get ahead of myself. But in those letters, there's such a warning and an encouragement that I feel uh, the church is in need of today, uh, that we need to be, one, we need to be, uh, having our, our mail read, so to speak. So in those seven letters that go out, and we'll get to that uh, next week in chapter two, but we see uh, God calling out to the church saying, I see this in you. I see these things. I see the good things that you've done. Great job. But I also see this. And if you don't stop this, I'm going to take my presence and my spirit and go elsewhere. And, and all of the seven different churches had things that they were doing well, and they had things that they weren't doing well, and some were uh, worse off than others. And it wasn't just for those specific churches, but it was an open letter, and everyone, was the entire church is supposed to be reading and hearing the words uh, of, of this prophetic book. And too often times this book has been, been misused or misunderstood. So uh, uh, this morning's message, or the series, is called Beasts, Dragons, and Scary Horsemen, Oh My. What every Christian needs to know about the often misunderstood and misused book of Revelation. And we'll just throw in a tidbit. It's Revelation. There's no S at the end. Many times you'll hear people and even pastors saying, the book of Revelations. There's no S. There's one revelation because it's revealing the one who is Christ. And so our big idea this morning as we delve into this is the book of Revelation is one of the most misunderstood and misused books of the Bible. As a result, many Christians either obsess over it or decide to completely ignore it. Revelation doesn't have to be confusing or scary, and it reveals a powerful and encouraging truth that every Christian should receive and hold on to. Who Jesus is, what He has done, is doing, and will do for and in and through us. So that's what we're going to be jumping into. And so we're going to be beginning, uh, if you have your Bibles with us or following on the text in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 through 8. And a lot of the, the things that I'm going to be teaching and pulling out of here are coming from a couple uh, renowned scholars, biblical scholars. So if you're interested, if you want to get deeper into that, I know if I can get excited and bore everyone else with it. But if that's you and you want to know more, uh, let me know and I'll help you uh, look at those resources and find those as well. But starting in verse 1, this is a revelation from, or depending on your translation, of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the events that must soon take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And it's believed to possibly be John the Beloved who wrote this. It could also maybe have just been a, uh, a prophet at the time named John who was working within the early church. But a lot of people uh, feel that this was quite possibly John the Beloved who wrote um, the epistles as well. So the book of Revelation, as I said, it's uh, one revelation of who Jesus is. In Revelation, it's a, a type of literature. So before we get into it, and this is why it gets kind of weird, um, how many of you know the, the Bible is made up of different types of literature? 
So it's not just one book, it's multiple books brought together. And so if you read the Gospels, it's got somebody telling a story like, I witnessed, I saw this, which is great. But if we read the book of Revelation the same way, it gets really weird, really scary, and we miss what God is actually wanting us to learn. So the book of Revelation is a type of literature called Jewish apocalyptic literature. It's similar in the Old Testament, uh, how Ezekiel was written, uh, Daniel, and the apocryphal books of 4 Ezra and, and 1 Enoch. So apocalyptic literature is symbolic imagery. So it's a sim- symbolism. It's painting these very vivid, uh, crazy pictures to help us grab hold of, of spiritual truth, of, of a heavenly picture of what is happening in the physical world around us and what has happened within humanity and in our relationship with with God and what He desires to do. And we see through Revelation this big, uh, the big encouragement I want us to, as we go through this, is take this out, is Jesus wins. Jesus wins, period, in the end. We win because we are in Christ. And so if we win in the end with Christ, then how we are to interpret and respond to suffering, persecution, and a feeling of losing in regards to the world's getting its way outside and around us helps us inform us how to, to respond to that. And so we got to keep, sometimes, I mean, you feel like you're, the world's winning sometimes. feel like things aren't going your way. Like, oh, man, we don't have to fear. We win. Even as the early church was about to face persecution, as they were, and this is why this book was written, the church would soon face horrible persecution under some of the, the, the Caesars that were there. And Jesus was speaking through John to let the church know you will persevere. You will win. Even if they kill your body, you win. And so with that confidence, knowing we win, all of a sudden the things around us that we get all discombobulated about and we start freaking out over, we don't have to. We can stay on mission. We can stay focused on what God is calling us to do. In the book of Revelation, it's also a, a prophecy of uh, God's revealing God's word, who is Jesus. So looking at verse 3. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church. And he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says. For the time is near. The time is near. And and so this book, this was being written, this um, prophetic word that was going out was a timely message for those that would hear it. So there are those that think that the book of Revelation is a secret code to try to figure out future events. And if you do this and you go this way and and cross-reference this and that, then you can figure out who, who this Antichrist. The book of Revelation was written to Christians just like you and I, who were living in a difficult world, and they felt overwhelmed, and they were soon to be persecuted. And so when John says, Time is near. He was meaning the time was near. That the things that he was be writing, they were going to experience. And as we know, we also experience these things as well. So this original audience would have understood the bizarre imagery of Revelation. So how many of you know that they would have, when it's talking about the dragons and the beast and Babylon and all this, the original audience were like, oh, I see what you did there. And it was kind of a revolutionary uh, work here too because according to the roman empire this is revealing who the true king is the true king of kings and so this letter has all this imagery in it as well that helps the church understand what john is teaching without necessarily getting them all arrested right away from this uh word that's going out telling them who their true king and lord is so what revelation is not So they just said, it's not a secret code that if you can unlock it, you can interpret world events and figure out when Jesus will return. It's a waste of time to do that. I know there's a lot of of preachers on TV trying to figure out. I'm just going to say it's a waste of time to try to figure that out. 
we get sidetracked on the things that don't matter and we neglect to do what we should be doing as the church, as the body of Christ. We read in Mark chapter 13, verse 32 through 37. However, no one knows the day or the hours these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself, only the Father knows. And since you don't know when that time will come, be on guard, stay alert. The coming of the Son of Man can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. And when he left home, he gave each of his slaves instructions about the work they were to do. And he told the gatekeepers to to watch for his return. And these are Jesus' words here. You too must keep watch, for you do not know when the master of the household will return. In the evening, at midnight, before dawn, or at daybreak. Don't let him find you sleeping When he arrives without warning, I say to you what I say to everyone, watch for him. So we are to, what Jesus was saying is we are to keep focused and our eyes turned to him. He was letting them know he was going to, he was going to be ascending and he would come back one day. And what he was saying is that we aren't supposed to be just standing on the, on the gates like, is he here, is he here? But we are to be doing simply what we are called to do. How many of you know your parents would leave the house sometimes and you had the house all to yourselves and your mom's like, hey, clean this up before I get back. And you spend half your time goofing off and then the last few minutes like, oh, is she here yet? Is she here yet? And you didn't get anything done. And that's kind of what Jesus is saying. He's like, I'm coming back. Just do what you're supposed to do. Don't worry about when I come back. If you do what you're supposed to do, you're not going to get caught off guard when I come back. So those first three verses of of Revelation are the the introduction of it. Let's pick up back in verse 4 here. This letter is from John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace to you. So if you're taking notes, you can write these down. From the one who is who always was, and who is still to come. From the sevenfold spirit before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, he is the faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead, and the ruler of all the kings of the world. Who is, who always was, and who is still to come. This is actually expounding on Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. When Moses asked God his name, he's like, who should I tell these people are sending me? And he said, tell them, I am who I am. I am who is. I am who was and who will always be. The consistent, unchanging, eternal nature of God is being revealed. We know that God is love, He is life, He is light, and He will never change. That God does not lie, He is faithful, He always fulfills His promises, and that will not change. He's reminding them that the God who who was, He still is. He will not let us down. The God who breathed through power and birthed the universe into existence is the God who still hovers over the chaos, bringing order out of it, is still the God who will return and make things new. And in Christ is God in all of that. We can read that part. It says from the sevenfold spirit. and That can seem kind of weird. But really what it's referencing is Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. And the spirit, and this was a messianic promise of who Jesus would, that, that I am, who was, who is, and will be, will rest, will be upon the Messiah. Will be in and upon Jesus. In Isaiah 11, verse 2, we read, And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. You can count with me. And the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And so these things it gives us, and that number seven is used throughout all of Revelation. It's a break um, um, imagery of completion. God created the universe and Um, seven days. And so anytime you see that, he's saying the fullness of God is what he's saying. The full attributes of God rest in Jesus. 
revealing the divine nature of who Jesus is in relation to the Father and the Holy Spirit. Jesus gave witness in his life, death, and resurrection to the true, faithful, and loving nature of God. What, what this is teaching us is when we look at Christ, when we look at how he lived, how he died, resurrected, everything he taught, we are looking upon the fullest revelation of God that we can possibly receive as human beings. Jesus rose not just as a witness of the nature of God, but to the power and the fulfillment of God's plan for us. He's the ruler of all kings of the world. Caesar did not like that message. Caesar wanted to be worshipped. Caesar wanted to be, be the God who ruled the world. But God is reminding his people through this book that Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Jesus is the ultimate authority we should submit our lives to. The early church, they had people saying, you should do this and you should do that. And he's saying, hold fast. The one and only authority that you must submit your life to is Christ and Christ alone. Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15, For at just the right time, Christ will be revealed from heaven by the blessed and only almighty God, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. So this revelation of, of Christ's divine authority and kingship is also echoed, we see later in, in Revelation chapter 17 and 19. Let's continue on verse 5 here. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Look, he comes with the clouds of heaven. It's echoing Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 there. And everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes and amen. This picture that at some point everyone will desire will be crying out for him. Verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Those were the, the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come, the Almighty One. And we see this, this theme of repetition often through this type of literature. And so this, uh, that's the one thing that John's really wanting us to take away from here. He repeats at the beginning and at the end that God is the one who was, who is, and is still to come. Jesus is God who was and is, and he is still to come. And what he's reiterating is that Jesus is above all kings. He's above all rulers. The kings, rulers, politicians, kingdoms, and political systems will come and they will go. Even the ones that persecute God's faithful, they will eventually die and turn to dust. And in the end, they have no power over us because we still live in Christ long after any of our enemies are gone. His promises for us are true and will remain. Resurrection and new life lay before us. Eternity lies before us. And so part of Revelation is trying to give us a, a, a heavenly perspective. I mean, you know, when you're in the trenches, when you're in life, it's hard to see the big picture. We just see the chaos, we see the brokenness, we see the frustration, we see, see the injustice, we see the things that irritate us. And sometimes it's not that they're bad, sometimes it's just we don't like it. But we, we see that, and, and in the midst of seeing that, we get clouded, and we miss that we are to have this bird's eye perspective, to mount up with wings of eagles. We are to soar above the chaos. As Jesus walked above the waters, pulled Peter up over, we are to walk over that, and we are to see with a kingdom perspective. We are to see the world around us differently, and that's why Revelation is so important. You see this vivid imagery and all this stuff taking place. It's to help us realize we need to see the world differently than the world sees itself. 
We need to see what's really going on. And, and practically, when we, we talk about this a lot, when we see people that we can't stand, we see people that might be our enemies, if we see them as the world, we see them as the problem. But as we'll see as we continue in this book, that when we have a God perspective, we begin to see that sin and brokenness and the evil forces of this world, that is the problem. And we began to see from a godlike perspective that God has already defeated those things. We have victory over those things. And no matter what happens in the physical, even though it may not be what I want, God is on his throne. And God's will is not dependent upon me getting my will. God's will will be done because he is who was and he is now and he forever will be. And I love the, this eternal perspective of a kind of a chess match. And we have free will in this world. That's why there's chaos. That's why um, God gives us the free will to choose. And the people around us have free will to choose. And, and uh, we make bad choices. Does anyone else here makes bad choices? I've made bad choices. Consequences aren't fun. The world around us makes bad choices. And, and, and there's this, like this, cosmic chess game taking place and God says you can move wherever you want but in the end it will be checkmate I will win and that's why in the chaos and the things around us how we we need to have this eternal perspective of who Christ really is he really is on his throne He's not oblivious as to what's happening around us. And there's times in my life where I'm like, God, do you not see what is happening? And I'm frustrated and I'm angry. And I just feel God's smiling. I don't know if God smirks, but that's what it feels like to me. I feel this divine smirk. Like, um, you think I don't see? I saw before you were born. And God's saying, I see. The problem is you don't see as I see. You don't see as I see. You don't see how minute and distracting and unimportant so many of these things are. Because in the end, I win. In the end, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And I love what we read later on in Revelation where Jesus says, I am making, behold, I am making all things new. We are in the process of being made new. And I love that picture, I'm, I'm making. It doesn't mean I made all things new. I'm making all all things new. We are in process. The world around us is in process. And we only get to see in part what God is going to do in full. So when he returns, the fullness of everything being made new will take place. I don't know how, what that's going to look like. But I know that God has always kept every word that he's ever given me. I know that every word in, in, in the Bible has been proven true. And so I can trust, I can stand with confidence that the God who was and did what he did is going to do what he's doing to completion and on into what will be. So this morning, I want us to help ourselves to kind of reconnect with the revelation of who Christ is. God, reveal to us again who he is. And when I began to realize and to re-understand, re-learn who Jesus really is, it kind of puts myself in perspective. It's a little bit humbling. Because then all of a sudden, I, I've got to start realizing if, if Jesus is who he said he is, and he is all of these things, 
then perhaps I'm not at the center of the universe. Perhaps I don't have all the answers. Perhaps I can trust that Jesus does. And when we begin to realize, we begin to realize who we are, because we can't understand and know who we are as Christians if we don't understand and know who Christ is. So the living God, the creator of all, who was, who is, and is to come, was in Christ. The Spirit of God was upon him. And Jesus said, I go, I will send you my Spirit. And you will be my body. Who and what is in us? What is our purpose? I love as we, we see our purpose here. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. Well, glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. God's people in the Old Testament, they, they were supposed to be a nation of priests. So what, they weren't supposed to just have a few people, a few men that a couple times if they bathed and did everything just right could stand in the presence of God. As we, we saw earlier, God wanted the entire nation to go up to the mountain with Moses and experience the presence of God. And God's people were to be a, a, a nation that was to be the door that all nations would be able to come and to know who Jesus, to know who God was. It wasn't supposed to be a building that was supposed to be the temple. And we see as and in Christ and we reveal that, that we together as the body of Christ, in Him we are the temple where His presence resides. We are the place where the people and the, that are broken around us can come and learn and experience who God is and become a part of that. That we are a kingdom. The kingdom of God is people. The kingdom of God is people. And so we are part of the kingdom of God. And if people are to, to see the fullness, the attributes of who God, we are to be allowing Christ to so permeate our lives, to allow the Holy Spirit to fill us and to flow out of us, that people can see the nature of God. That we can teach them and say, come. And, and so then it also gives us a perspective that, that, that changes our purpose. Our purpose is to live and to carry with us the presence of God that others might know Him. Everything else in our life is secondary, must be in servitude to that purpose. And then it changes the way we see the world around us. Because the kingdom of God is supposed to expand. The kingdom of God is, to, is to, to overtake the kingdoms of this world. And as we'll see, he's warning the church. They would go through some horrible persecution. They would feel that they were losing. But the more adversity, the more that came against them, the faster the church grew. Mr. Tullian, uh, early church father, said the, the blood of the martyr was the seed of the church. Because God always wins. And when we have that purpose understood, when we have that perspective, then all of a sudden the world around us is not something to be destroyed. It is something to be redeemed. It's something to be brought under the authority of Christ. It is something to be redeemed and restored and healed. That the people around us are potentially future parts of the kingdom of God. The people we can't stand the most, we are to see them as potential parts of the kingdom of God. And who am I to wage war and try to destroy the kingdom of God? We are either for God or we are against Him. Jesus is on His throne. He will return. 
And we live with His grace and peace upon us even now. I love that blessing in the, the beginning of this, of this chapter. God's grace and peace upon you, even in the midst of turmoil. Even if you are in the midst of persecution, even if you are in the midst of, of a storm in life, may you still experience the grace and peace of God. We live with His grace and peace upon us as we stay faithful to Him. Because He is always faithful to us in and out of every season. Even in times of tribulation and persecution, we will overcome and not be defeated. Because it's not our doing, it's His. Because Jesus has all ready one so in closing this morning just as a response maybe we need to be reminded of who Jesus is I have to be reminded I have to be reminded that Jesus already saved the world he doesn't need me to run off and try to do it myself Maybe we need to be reminded of who Jesus is, that he is still king of kings. He is still greater than our circumstances. Maybe we need to be reminded of the hope that we have in him. Maybe we need that hope renewed within us this morning. Maybe we need our eyes to help be turned off of our circumstances We need to be lifted up out of it and be able to see with a divine, heavenly perspective our lives and the situations around us. And have our eyes focused on the one who is greater than our circumstances. One who is greater than than the turmoil or the affliction that we may have within us. So the worship team would join me this morning. I just like each and every one of us just to humble ourselves and just pray, God, remind us of who you are. And I think sometimes it's easy for us to, when we're in the midst of things not going the way we want, and I think that's one of the reasons it's so important that we have this, this perspective of who Christ really is and what's really happening in the world around us, is that when things aren't going the way we'd like, when when we are stuck in the brokenness of this world, when we are experiencing persecution or, or trials and tribulations in our lives, that sometimes it can feel as though God is against us. It can sometimes feel that, that we are enemies of God and He just doesn't want us to be happy or to actually have that peace and grace. And as we see in Christ the full nature of God, we see that while we were at our worst, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So whether we deserve it or not, God is for us. And He is cheering for us. Heavenly hosts are cheering and and applauding for us to persevere, to cling and to hang on to who Christ is to allow His Spirit to to strengthen us and to carry us through life. So I just want to read Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 through 26. May the Lord bless you and protect you. I love this part. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. 